Business for Philanthropy, and much, much more. Um, so to begin today, we thought, what about playing a game? <laughs> this isn't something we've necessarily done before in our wisdom conversations, but we thought if we're really looking at each other as possible partners, as possible um, you know, collaborators for the new markets that we want to establish, let's find out how much we really know about one another. And this is where you're naming yourself by your country um, has, is, is, has become important. So this is how it's gonna work. I say a country, and you type in the chat the first thing that comes to your mind about that country. Got it? So I'll say a country, and you type into the chat the first thing that comes to your mind about that country. Are we ready? Oh, here's, here's one thing. If you don't know, you don't know, and you can say that you've never heard of it, okay? So this is about honesty and zero judgment. One, two, three. St. John. <laughs> Perfect. And if there's anybody from St. John here in particular, I would like you to be paying attention to what is being written. Okay. Number two, Kenya. And anybody from Kenya, be paying attention to what is being written. Okay. Nice, okay. We seem to know a lot more about Kenya than we do about St. John. All right. Curaçao. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Curaçao. I like that one. <laughs> okay, Nigeria. Wow, okay. All right. Jamaica. Jamaica. 
All right. <laughs> okay, still going. <laughs> okay, Argentina. <laughs> if you're from Argentina, Pay attention to the comments coming up on screen. Okay. Okay, Tanzania, and if you are from Tanzania, pay close attention to what is being written about you on the screen. Next one, Tobago. <laughs> All right. Nice. What about the Democratic Republic of Congo? If you are from the Democratic Republic of Congo or have an idea about it, you may be wanting to look at what's popping up on the screen.
Okay. So we have a whole range of answers, which we have been sharing in the chat. Has everyone managed to read the responses? More or less? Here's the question. Is what is being said about these countries, perhaps they are your countries, is what is being said fact or fiction? Are they truths or stereotypes? Oh, let me add one more, Suriname. What do we know about Suriname? Okay, so if you are from Suriname, you want to be paying attention to what's coming up. Okay. Beautiful. We have a range of responses about each of the countries mentioned. And my question is, is what is being said about these countries fact or fiction? Are they truths or stereotypes? And we are going to give the opportunity to one person, just one person representing each of the countries called out to educate us on the truth. What is it that we don't know and we ought to know about you? So we'll give you one minute to tell us your truths <laughs> and everybody else while listening to that representative can share in the chat. So why don't we go from where we left off, Suriname. Rainier, would you, would you like to share what about Suriname was truth? Or I, would like, I, I would like, because we have, a, we have a very high person from Suriname, and that is the president of the Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Anil okay. Padarat. So I would give him the first choice. Okay, Anil, perfect. Anil, can you come in? Okay, um, Rain, I, I was just leaving it for you. I'm just following uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, the meeting, and um, afterward I will uh, respond. But I will leave it to Taos. Uh, Taos, go ahead. Uh, I'm just following it. This is my first time, and uh, I'm new here, and uh, I will respond later <laughs> on. <laughs> well, okay, okay. For everyone's voice. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, I, back to you. yes, well, I see an important fact there and there's 39% coverage of forests. I will, I want to stay with that because that is very important and that is presently a hot issue in Suriname because mining is increasing, uh, gold and uh, the, 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 the hunger for gold, uh, 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 wood are destroyed because it is exported. So uh, there is, uh, I, I personally wrote a letter uh, in the media to that now it is the moment for Suriname to wake up and keep this 39% because we have seen in the world that they were talking once about 90 plus percent of forests and within no time it has become 5%, 10%, very low. That is a very important point I want to stress, our force. Further Suriname is, is a multicultural society. I think we are the only country on the, on, on the world 
that had so much races in the country, so many cultures in the country, and still we are not fighting. And we have so many religions in the country, and still we are not fighting. That's a very important fact for Suriname. Fertile Suriname has high potentials for agriculture. They found in Suriname also a, 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 a large gas oil uh, uh, resource. Uh, we have a very nice interior in Suriname. Yes, it is true that an, uh, uh, a part of our, our, our uh, young ladies are not so well educated. Uh, educated and that is a um, uh, uh, high percentage in the interior but because that is far away and uh, education was not given there but I am glad that the recent election has gone and it is a, a multicultural uh, a government now and they are bringing the education also to the interior let me stop otherwise other people will not have chance to talk thank you <laughs> Thank you so much for clarifying, for distinguishing what is true and what isn't. And I'm going to ask now, um, why, Nicolette, I see you. <laughs> Would you like to speak up for what you've seen about the DRC? And if you'd like to add also from your perspective on other, on other countries in Africa mentioned, and we will also come to those, but um, go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Zaina. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So um, a lot of what I've seen is true. I think I see uh, uh, King Leopold of Belgium, who uh, was responsible for many of the atrocities that happened uh, towards the end of the 1980s, uh, early 1990s. We do, we are very mineral rich. So I see someone wrote poverty, but we're actually very mineral rich and unfortunately run an extractive economic model which means that um, all our raw materials is always leaving and we're not actually um, producing value in the way that we're, we're extracting some of those minerals. Uh, let's see, well, we're colonized by Belgium. That's also true. Uh, we had a civil war in the 90s, which is also um, continuing within the East region, um, which is also a, so, uh, based on the minerals. So it's always the minerals with Congo. Um, there is violence to women. We had a doctor who won a Nobel Peace Prize because of his work with women in the East. So that's also true. Um, but other than that, I also want to add that we're very resilient people. Um, we, we've had a very traumatic history. We are always working to overcome. We are always working to, um, to build new opportunities, to create new opportunities for ourselves. So uh, I, I think I, I'm always hopeful that we will get it right eventually. But yes, uh, a lot of what they've said, gorillas, we have silverback gorillas, <laughs> we have wonderful wildlife. Um, and yeah, that's most, most of that is true. Uh, the other thing I was going to say, East Africa with me, it's funny, speaking, hearing Tanzania and Kenya, I think tourism, um, simply because I, I tend to think that a lot of foreigners that we that come to the continent tend to go to these two countries for tourism. Uh, I've personally never been to uh, Tanzania, but I'd love to go to Zanzibar. And then Nigeria is where I've done most of my business. So for me, it's the land of opportunities. <laughs> That's what okay. I consider that to be. Thank you so much. So why don't we actually segue into Nigeria? Um, and I see that we have a couple of people here. Would anybody like to would anybody like to speak about Nigeria? Okay, let me talk about Nigeria. Ojiniki? Oji, yes. Yes, perfect. Okay. Yes, um, I guess people know a lot about Nigeria because they say that one in four um, black is um, a Nigerian. And um, we have about almost 200 million Nigerians. And we're very enterprising people. I guess that also causes problems for us because wherever we go to, whichever country we go to, we, we, we find that we almost take over the commerce there. And so it creates problems with, our, <laughs> with our people, we, um, other, other um, nationals. But we have three main tribes in Nigeria, the Igbos, the Yorubas, and, and the Hausas. I saw somebody wrote there, Yoruba. So it's one of the three main tribes, Yorubas, Igbos, and Hausas. And um, oil is our main um, product. Somebody mentioned that a lot of people mentioned oil, I guess, you know, because of oil. In, you know. um, so we have oil and it forms more than 90% of our um, revenue. Um, just like I think Lady said earlier on, part of the problems we have is that we, we have the oil, we ex explore it, but we don't 
refine it so we don't add value and so you know so even with minerals don't add value so it's not getting us much value um another thing about nigeria is that um we were once a british colony and we gained our independence in 1960 and um uh, the capital of nigeria is lagos sorry abuja but lagos is a is the financial is a commercial capital and so a lot of people will know about lagos they will have heard about lagos I mean, Lagos is a bit like, well, I say New York, because it's live 24 seven. You can go out at any time of the day to buy things, you know, so it's always bustling in Lagos. Um, sorry, I think I forgot to say that Nigeria is in West Africa because I think I saw somebody wrote South Africa. Mm -hmm. It's in West Africa and not South Africa. Um, what else about Nigeria? They say we're the happiest people in the world because we're always happy, we're always enjoying ourselves. We like to enjoy ourselves and so, <laughs> <laughs> always partying and so it's been quite difficult for some people during this lockdown you know but i, I guess we're, we're happy people because i mean things are things are we've had issues with governance and um and so things are not the way it should be so we have issues in the infrastructure problem and all that but we're very confident we can, we'll come out of it perfect thank you so much and i'll just ask everybody if you can name yourself with your country um, right, right next to your name so that you're easily identifiable also by the country you're representing. Thank you to everyone who has um, correctly represented their country to this point. So let's move on to Argentina. Who would like to tell us if what they saw on, uh, come up on the chat about Argentina is fact or fiction? Natalia, I see you. Would you like to, would you like to speak on behalf? of Argentina, perfect. Hello, hello, good morning for us and good, good afternoon for you. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to participate of this meeting. I'm, I feel very happy to see so many people from the other part of the world, <laughs> most of them. Thank you. Thank you, Saina and Costa. Uh, well, Argentina is all you, you write, you, you write on the, on the dialogue uh, and we have uh, really during this day we are uh, in a very deep crisis so uh, what i i can say that we are very worried about that so it's very difficult for us to plan uh, in a long term distance so we're trying to find solution for the short time uh, every day uh, we are trying to um, uh, put some uh, dialogue, dialogue spaces uh, uh, on the top, especially in, in for example, in, in my city. I, I live in a city, in an intermediate city, San Nicolas City is in the north of Buenos Aires province. Uh, it's a medium size in uh, 160,000 people. We are a majority, people working for, uh, in my case, I, I work for the, um, it's an agency, a public private agency, and we are working in development and in partnership. So uh, this time is not easy for Argentina, I think, but we, we have hope <laughs> to, to find a solution in the short term. Thank you. Muchas I, gracias. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Natalia. Thank you Thank for demystifying Argentina for us. What about yes. Tobago? <laughs> well, Tobago is. Uh, I see a lot of misconceptions in the in the chat. Tobago is not a part of Trinidad. It is not a colony of Trinidad. It's an island in the nation of Trinidad and Tobago with its own interests and its own identity. It actually has an Eastern Caribbean identity, much more so than a Trinidadian identity. Although Trinidadians may not be willing to admit to that. I suppose the main things that I would point people to is that Tobago has, is the least developed of all Caribbean islands. And it has an abiding interest in pursuing the development ideals articulated by Caribbean scholars over the decades. 
And as a central part of that, uh, the people I meet and talk to every day, they are all dedicated to trying to build an inclusive democracy on the island. So that's a better conception of Tobago than as a part of Trinidad, so to say. Thank you so much, Vanus. Thank you for clarifying that. Extremely important because I know for sure um, that we tend to think of it as, as, as one and very rarely in terms of what, what value Tobago itself brings. Um, so thank you for that. And okay, what about Kenya? Anybody here from Kenya? Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, Honorable, yes. Honorable Fabian. Fabian, yes. Honorable My Fabian. name is Fabian Chulemuli, member of parliament from Kenya. I think I don't have much to speak today. It's my first time I've joined. And I have many things to talk about Kenya. And I'll be happy to first have a following, then later on I come to the contribution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. And what was said about Kenya was that it's Africa, animals, wildlife, safari, um, good democracy, commercial hub, Kilimanjaro, agriculture, flowers, jewelry, and business. Is there anybody here from Kenya who would like to tell us whether that is fact or fiction? And if there's anything else we ought to know about the country. Gusto? Oh, come here. You can use, you can, you can share screen. Gusto is our honorary Kenyan. <laughs> you don't need to bring that. You need my screen? <laughs> Hi, everyone. Jumbo. They are, yeah, you know, most of the things are facts. It's a hub of East Africa, it's the entry port for all the, you know, 14, 15 countries that you have in the Comesa. Uh, it's a, the commercial market for all the 14, 15 countries that you have in Horn of Africa and East Africa. Kilimanjaro, it used to be part of Kenya, but then it was given as a present by the British colony around 1914. Uh, 1915, but it's part of uh, Tanzania these days. They are Omari, who is our Tanzanian representative, who lives in Argentina, can tell us more about Tanzania. But yeah, I, I'm married to a Kenyan, and best partnership that you can have <laughs> between Latin America and Africa. So, and of course, you know, the Caribbean, we will have our second honeymoon there. <laughs> And yeah, we continue with the presentations and thank you everyone. Karibu, as it is in Kiswahili, that's the, the language that we speak in East Africa. Gracias. <laughs> thank you so much, Justo. Um, and actually, let's, uh, oh, I see we have Polo Tieno. Um, so if you have anything to add about Kenya, please do. We have uh, Dr. Rosemary. Um, Otherwise, we will segue straight into Tanzania. Omari, you can unmute yourself. I see, I see you there. And what I can learn about uh, Kenya. Oh, sure, yes. What, has, yeah, what, I, what I can learn about Kenya is again, uh, Kenya is playing a very uh, important role because uh, it is the headquarters of UN in, in Africa. So, uh, uh, and again, it uh, attracts a lot of uh, foreign uh, direct investment because of the way the business environment is, it is enabled. And uh, in terms of uh, skills, uh, it, it also has the most educated uh, people in the continent other than South Africa. So when it comes to the skills and all that, it, 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 yeah, Kenya is quite, uh, quite uh, well-oppressed. 
And uh, there's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that uh, Kenya offers in the continent because it is also argued that uh, what, can, what can work in Kenya can actually work in the other uh, parts of the continent because okay. of uh, the history, the stability, the peace and uh, the development. Uh, in terms of infrastructure is very high and uh, again tourism is number one because uh, we have a lot of diversity which mm. is from the Great Rift Valley, the wildlife, the, the coast, the beaches, uh, the food, the people and then the, the, there's a lot to offer in Kenya. Thank you so much for stepping in for your country. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, why don't we take it to Jamaica? Oh no, Omari, have you been able to, yeah, to yeah. unmute? Yes, I see you. Great. We're on to Tanzania. Is what was said on the chat fact or fiction? <laughs> uh, we can't hear you, so I think you just have to sort out your sound and we're going to come back to you. Okay, we're gonna come back to you. Okay, who's speaking for Jamaica? Wagwan, Jamaica. Okay, um, I guess I'll have to do that. Good morning, everyone. Um, <laughs> Good morning. My name is Trudy Bell. All right, so um, everything that I saw there was pretty much facts. Uh, we are, Bob Marley's from Jamaica, you know, music is a big part of our culture. Dancing is a huge part of our culture as well. Yes, I saw um, they talk about sun. Um, they talk about nice people. Yes, we have a lot of nice people. Well, of course, you know, nice is subjective. Um, but generally, uh, we have nice people. Um, what would I like people to know about our country? Um, Jamaicans are very protective. We are very pr proud people and we're very protective about our country. Um, we, we are always cheering on, whether it's our athletes, you know, anyone that represents Jamaica, um, we are always cheering them on. When it comes to, that's one thing that brings us together. Once we know that there is a Jamaican out there doing something big or doing something at all, everybody just comes together and we cheer them on. And also, Jamaica is known as one of those countries that have a lot of women um, that are in management positions, a lot of women in leadership roles, and that's something that I'm very proud of. You know, there are a lot of female entrepreneurs and stuff like that. So, yeah, pretty much that's it. Beautiful. Thank you for stepping up, um, Trudy. So what we're going to do now is um, go into a, uh, a couple of, uh, well, an actual conversation. We will come back to allow everybody to speak up and tell us the truth. Uh, distinguish between the, the fact and fiction of their countries. But we do actually want to hear um, a little bit about how can the Caribbean rethink enterprise with Africa. And for that, I would like to invite Professor Rosalie Hamilton and to thank Trevor Firon, who I believe has joined us for the introduction. Um, she is the founding director at the Institute of Law and Economics. She is also the CEO of the Lasco Chin Foundation, vice president at the University of Technology of Jamaica, the founder of the MSME Alliance, which is a network of small business organizations, a board director for Lasco Manufacturing Limited and National Integrity Action, which is a career corruption watchdog organization and the chair of the newly created Caribbean Philanthropic Alliance, a hub of philanthropy connections in the Caribbean region. In 2008, she was awarded professorship in the Scotia Bank Chair in Entrepreneurship and Development. She has worked as a consultant and public educator on trade, governance, gender, and other areas of e economic and social development. She has taught at the graduate and undergraduate levels in Jamaica and the US and served as special advisor and trade policy consultant in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade for her country and the chief advisor to the Prime Minister of Jamaica from May 2006 to September 2007. So if that is not enough in the few conversations that I have been able to um, have with Rosalie, she is a woman of vision, a woman of merit, 
and truly deserving of all the accolades, which are really a testament to your contribution uh, you know, over and above your accomplishments. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And we're truly looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us from the Caribbean perspective about rethinking enterprise with Africa. Thank you so much, Zana. And let me just correct, I was vice president at the University of Technology. I'm no okay. longer vice president. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start by just sharing screen and um, just get, take you through this um, presentation. Um, my thoughts about the rethinking enterprise um, will cover four broad areas, a brief historical overview of global trade, um, just some key lessons from that history, and lessons for Caribbean businesses, and just some ideas about what we should do. And the presentation will be guided by this perspective. Our history of global trade relations should guide our thinking about new business relationships in the future. Now, um, we are a creature of globalization and the Caribbean global trade relations are rooted in this history of the transatlantic trade of enslaved Africans, cotton, sugar, rum, and more with Europe. We also have another triangular trade that's less referred to and this is the triangular trade with enslaved Af African sugar and rum with New England. And so our histories um, are very similar to that of African Americans in North America. Now, if we can do a very quick overview of the period from about the 14, 1500s into the 1800s, we see that period of the transatlantic um, slave um, trade where millions were uprooted. In fact, the numbers in that diagram that you see number about 8.3 million people taken across the region. Um, other estimates estimate about 10 to 15 million. And of course, we have another estimated 2 million died during that middle passage. And it is estimated over the four centuries of the institution of slavery more than about, more than 50 million persons have died. And of course, those numbers are being debated by scholars, but that gives you a scale of what has happened. And the key features, of course, European hegemony, the inhumane enslavement of Africans, the exploitation of labor power, piracy as part of the, on, um, you know, the, 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 the loose rules of trade at that time, and all created what one could consider primitive capital accumulation in Europe and North America. Now, if we fast track to the post-slavery colonial period and imperialism, and again, uh, just broad time frames around the 1800s and the 1900s, we see as we moved away from the period of enslaved, using enslaved Africans for labor, we shifted to indentured labor, mainly from India and China, um, as well as um, some Europe, um, English countries as well, um, Wales and others. Now, this period we saw political, economic and legal dominance and economic and um, uh, all of that dependence on the motherland. Um, the racial inequality, of course, was evident, cultural subordination, and we saw preferential trade arrangements, mainly special tariff arrangements, et cetera, that characterizes trade during this period. And of course, it's a huge generalization. Historians, of course, will take me to task, but I'm just trying to give a historical um, background very quickly. So this picture speaks to the champions of colonialism. Here we have 13 countries. Um, the collective colonies of these 13 countries, about 365 colonies. And what's interesting about this map is that all except Greece were around the table, the Berlin Conference, that pretty much worked around the arrangements for colonized in Africa. And uh, in fact, if you add the US and the Ottoman Empire, 
those were the, I think, 15 countries that were part of the Berlin Conference, 1884 to 85. Now, they came to that conference with these colonies in their back pockets. Um, the British, the, the French settlement, of, sorry, the Spanish, the Spanish, of course, they're very early. And all that you see in that map in red is where the Spanish settled. You see the French um, footprints in blue, and you had, of course, the English and their settlements um, in that purple color and Dutch. So you see Surina, uh, Curacao there <clears throat> with that um, yellow square um, rectangle. And um, that gives you a, a good feel for how these colonial powers had, um, you know, created these colonies in the Caribbean. We fast track now to the post-colonial independence era, the 40s to the 80s. The key features were the national independence movement. And we had the emergence of major institutions, the Bretton Wood institutions, that really um, tried to put some kind of orderly development to the world economy in the, um, after the aftermath of the World War II. Um, um, events. And the World Bank and the IMF were created. The General Agreement on Tariffs on Trade, the GATT, um, came into being, and that was the first attempt to kind of begin to formalize trade rules. Also significant for us is the ACP, the African-Caribbean Pacific relationship with Europe, the EU, through their development cooperation. And out of that, came these very significant trade agreements, um, Yaoundé Agreement, um, named after the cities in which these agreements were signed in Cameroon, in the case of Yaoundé, um, Lome Conventions, that's a, um, in, in Togo, and um, the Cotonou Agreement in Benin. And the latest expression of those agreements is the Economic Partnership Agreements, and all an attempt to redefine the nature of the relationship between Africa, Caribbean, and Pacific with varying degrees of success. Um, the modern era, if we can get to where we are now, we see the liberalization of global markets across the world. And a major attempt in 1995 to put rules in place to guide this trade. This is the emergence of the World Trade Organization. And with that, there were a number of trade arrangements regionally in an attempt to manage what could be seen as very, um, very elaborate liberalization rules that some countries are not ready for. And so special arrangements were made within the regional arrangements um, the economist Bagwati refers to it as a spaghetti root bowl of three, three, um, regional, regional arrangements because there were so many and countries, one country would have three or four or five of these regional arrangements. We also saw the significant outsourcing and offshoring of jobs. So um, we had companies in one country, of course, um, outsourcing a lot of work in other countries and all leading to the political reshaping of the world order. What are some lessons from this history that we should learn? I think the first most important one is the increasingly competitive global markets that are driven by rapidly changing technologies. What we've seen is a shift from human and physical capital to knowledge and skills as the focus of global trade and the focus of what is required to become globally competitive. What is true is that the winners, because they're winners and losers, and they've always have been since the inception of this global process, the winners are still the former colonizers. In fact, more than half of our imports and exports come from Europe and the US. But we also see the rise of other countries, what are referred to as the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, big C China, big country in that, um, 
group of five countries and a South Africa. Um, and other emerging markets, you have Turkey and other um, South Korea and so on. And these are dominating global trade. And what we've seen is the erosion of the traditional market dominance. And that, of course, has triggered reaction, the reactions you see in Europe, in the US. And the data is, is telling of, of that erosion. Developing countries' exports as a share of world trade grew from about 26% in 1995 to over 44% by 2018. And the developed countries' exports as a share of world trade declined um, from about 70% in 1995 to about 53% in 2018. So you begin to see that these shifts are an important reason why you're seeing a lot of the global instability. Now, in terms of global trade, that history has not served the Caribbean's interests well. I want to highlight the 2003 Antigua Barbuda internet gambling case that sin since then has not yet been settled. In fact, it was taken, we had it here in this case, if you don't know the details, of course we can Google it, there's not enough time to get into the details. But this is one of the smallest countries in the world, taking one of the largest countries in the world, the US, to the dispute settlement mm -hmm. arrangements in the WTO. And in fact won. Um, they won a settlement of $21 million annually until the matter is resolved. But to date has not received a cent and the matter is still not settled. And so although you have a dispute settlement arrangement that ought to help to level the playing field, in this case, we see that those who can dominate and shape the rules continue to win. And so you began to see the collapse of the World Trade Organization when the Doha Round um, collapsed in 2008. And we see today increasing skepticism on the part of the WTO, on the part of the US about the WTO. And the WTO today is in, is in flux. The future of global trade rules now in doubt. So, the, re, so the, the, the legal arrangements underpinning trade that ought to help developing countries in the Caribbean in particular is just not working. Another important lesson is the growing inequalities. And I know that we're well aware of it. I thought I'd share some recent data from Oxfam. Oxfam just pointed out that 2,153 persons owns more than 4.6 billion persons in the world. That's about 60% of the world. Um, when I did the cal calculation, it sounded like 0.00005% of persons own more than 60% of the world. That's staggering. And an important issue for all of, the, all of us women is that only 22 of the richest men in the world have more wealth than all women in Africa. That's stunning. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you a sense of, of that. Um, there's lots of data out there. And I wanted to point out that these inequities persist during COVID. And so we see significant, again, data from Oxfam, 400 million jobs lost, and yet 32 of the world's most profitable companies are expected to make 109 billion more than um, in 2020 than they did in the previous year. So uh, this disruption in global trade, I think, provides us another opportunity. We've always had to be rethinking the, the, what has happened to us in the past um, and the inherited problems that we've carried to the modern world. And the promise to build back better and to restructure our trade relations po post-COVID is still an um, unfinished agenda. Now, what are some of the lessons for Caribbean businesses? I think if we look at the historical features of global trade, the, the persistent dominance of the colonizers, the um, countries that have um, were, were, were featured in that historical grab for wealth across the world. 
um, and, and also consider the inadequate national policies to date. Because while our countries have tried, we've negotiated all of these um, agreements and so on, and we're still in the throes of the EPA, Economic Partnership Agreement, the, the, the policy have not yet curbed some of the persistent problems. And any business, especially small, micro, medium-sized businesses, MSMEs, um, understand this well. And if we, I think it's a time for businesses to rethink the status quo, to rethink the current arrangement and the extent to which they can grow, do well, become profitable in the current arrangement. Also, we need to consider the importance of knowledge and innovation as critical drivers for global competitiveness and profitability. And whether we have systems in place in our countries to um, promote, encourage, and stimulate and drive innovation and knowledge creation. We have educational institutions that continue to perpetuate old, given knowledge and not seen as generators and incubators of new knowledge. And that's the transition I think we absolutely need for our educational institutions. And so I think we urgently need to actively find new markets and to engage these markets on new terms, terms that are advantageous, terms that can enable us to grow and develop our economies. And I want to highlight two reasons I think this is an imperative. It is essential for growth and development in the Caribbean. I think the size constraints are fairly obvious. We have a limited market, but if we think about the dominance of the traditional elite in these markets, we can see that there's little wiggle room for micro, small, medium-sized businesses to flourish in our existing markets. And that's one important reasons why businesses must look global. The global market is an infinite market. We also must address our balance of payments problems. And all our economies, most of them, if not all, are highly import dependent. The numbers with respect to the importation of food, 80% dependent on our food, um, imported food. And so to address these economic issues, we, we must look at new markets and be able to earn um, income, foreign exchange that can help to deal with our debt problem that we have in many of the countries and to facilitate growth and development. And importantly, we need this kind of economic space for growth to build a more equitable people-centered here in society. We exist in one of the most violent regions of the world with the highest per capita murder rate. And these and other social problems are part of the issues that we have to tackle. So we have to find opportunities for a better, more equitable society. I want to raise the second reason which I think most of us have not paid enough attention to um, with respect to why we need global markets and we need to re-engage our markets. The we know about the climate change problem and we understand that it's an existential crisis for us in the Caribbean. And so we have to find climate resilient technologies and strategies, advocacy to ensure that we can slow this process down, if not reverse it. But I think many of us are not fully grasping the significance of us in the Caribbean becoming climate refugees in the future. There's a 2018 World Bank study that I suggest that we look at. And that study actually suggests that by 2050, the Caribbean and over 100 million people across the world will be climate refugees. And that's something worth thinking about. So what should businesses do? Forge new partnerships to re redefine the global engagement. And I suggest that the private public sector in, in, um, relationship is key. We need governments that can represent our interests and understand the need to address these historical legacies. And so good participatory governance is key so that the voice of the private sector, the voice of those most affected by the current arrangements can be heard. 
by extension, we need appropriate trade policies and other relevant policies. And we have to actively facilitate trade of the most creative um, um, members of our society who can go into the global market, earn foreign exchange, and address some of our challenges. And, and I, in that context, we need to turn our trade missions and um, move away from diplomatic arrangements to trade arrangements. Economic diplomacy is what we need to actively engage um, the world. Um, in terms of business trusts and association, these are key, key to advocacy. We um, have more say in numbers. And so we have to engage our organizations and have them actively involved. So I'm very pleased to see members of the Chamber of Commerce here and part of this conversation. We have to learn that we have to collaborate to compete globally. It is a global market, especially from small island development states. We have to collaborate more as we challenge the global market. Regional and international alliances are key pivotal. It is absolutely necessary to penetrate the markets that we're going into. The diaspora organizations, I think, are important. We have a presence in these markets, and therefore we ought to exploit and use them as best we can. And uh, these will help us to address trade barriers. Sometimes these are um, non-tariff barriers that we have to work through, and of course, to foster um, innovations. And I suggest that the focus must be on new methods, new products, new markets. It, that includes, by the way, new niches in old markets. So we're already in Europe and in the US. Let's find niches. Let's go after these markets and let's be very proactive. The cultural creative industries are key to this. By definition, they're creative and they're opportunities for creative creativity that are, that are bound. But we also must adopt and create new cutting edge, uh, cutting edge technologies that embrace the AIs and robotics and all of these kinds of technologies that are the technologies of the future. We must embrace those. And engage in South-South trade, including small island developing states that understand our realities. Um, you know, I, I, I talk about, for example, virtual in the context of what's happening with tourism, virtual tourism where we can virtually hop from Jamaica to Trinidad and Tobago to Bahamas, to the rhythms of reggae and Calypso and Chancuno, and then pop over to the um, Polynesian islands, you know, Fiji and so on, to Polynesian music. All of that is possible in the virtual world. And those are the issues I think we have to concentrate and uh, um, to consider seriously. The, the BRICS, as I said, um, China in particular, we have to engage them and we have people in the, we had these indentured servants and others who came from China and India. Um, Brazil, of course, is, um, shares our reality. All of these countries are important. South Africa, we, of course, are tied to as part of our African connection. Africa is the fastest growing market. That was the data we had pre-COVID. And so we ought not to ignore the African markets. And the African diaspora, we have a standing open inv invitation to trade with Africa. The African diaspora division embedded in the AU constitution um, tells us that they want us to implement the AU decisions to encourage the diaspora to participate in the building and development of Africa. So I think we're invited, unlike other countries, we're invited to Africa and that's important. Finally, I want to say this, and these are the words of our national hero, Marcus Magaya Gabi. A race that is solely dependent upon another for its economic existence sooner or later dies. So we will in the future suffer if an effort is not made now to adjust our own affairs. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Hamilton. Please everyone unmute so we can acknowledge Rosalie in the way that she deserves having really presented an incredible Brilliant. historical overview to demonstrating true opportunity and actions for moving ahead. Related to that, not a whole, a, a lot of what you presented about the, 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 what is going on in the Caribbean is not distinct to, to is not indistinct to, to what we are facing in Africa. Um, I know that there are questions and comments, so please keep track of those and we're gonna take them right after I add my part about Africa. Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. 
If you want to go far, go together. And I believe that that is something that the, the, the model of Pan-Africanism, uh, which uh, Marcus Garvey and, and others in the continent had initiated, were really looking at, and it's an, it's an African proverb. Um, well, for those of you who have just joined us, and thank you for joining us from everywhere that you are, different parts of the world in different time zones, I am Zaina Africa, the founder of South South Women and the director of South South and Triangular Corporation. I am an African woman, born and raised in Kenya, a voice for progress for the continent, a conscious businesswoman, impact investor, and a spiritual coach. For your information, I led two South-South business summits in Kenya and Argentina in 2016 and 2017, respectively, which culminated in the first investment by a Jamaican company in the government of Kenya, a project to reduce carbon emissions, a company on whose board I am a director, and I'm also the founding president of a not-for-profit organization reducing crime on the continent through rugby in prisons, education in the new citizen and support for reintegration of people in prison into society because I believe in a crime-free continent for business to prosper. How does my introduction relate to how Africa can rethink enterprise with the Caribbean and the global south? Let's go back to the statistics. So global sources on Africa are saying that the continent is now experiencing its first economic recession in 25 years. The growth projection has fallen from an average of 7% under normal circumstances to 2%. Staggering statistics. However, the market opportunity of 1.2 billion people has not changed. In fact, it's growing and so are the needs. And my question is, who currently determines what Africa and Africans need? Who are the current drivers of prosperity in business and development? Who formulates our agenda for trade and cooperation? Is it the government? Is it the UN? Is it international trade agreements? Is it foreign investors? Has it been COVID? I used to believe all of that until I created my own companies, including South South Women and Merging Mundos, deeply rooted in values I saw were missing, pulled by future thinking visions that set us up as leaders, built upon harsh lessons learned and purposed to provide solutions to our own problems. We could say, I saw truth, that we, you and I know and determine what we need. You and I deploy the creative resources to fulfill an entrepreneurial dream. And perhaps you and I have for too long been dependent on others to drive the dream for us. Yes, in institutional and international mechanisms can be facilitators, educators, allies, credibility enhancers, and sometimes even partners, but they are not the entrepreneurs. And the world needs visionaries now, bold, confident risk takers rising to the opportunity of our own vision, guided by self-defined purpose in endeavors which favor the prosperity of all, not perfectionists, not users, not self-interested conformists. Because we have a new opportunity to set our own standards for wealth and progress and success and cooperation especially when, as Rosalie pointed out, more global reports tell us today that 1% of the world owns 44% of the world's entire wealth, and that just over 2,000 billionaires have more wealth than 60% of the world's population combined. So yes, approximately 10 of those billionaires are African, because we are by no means a poor continent. We are rich as Niclet was, was talking about the Democratic Republic of Congo, the most, the richest mineral resource country in the world. We are rich. The talent and creativity of our young population and our natural resources are by far our greatest assets. The wisdom of our ancestors is inseparable from our values of community, respect, respect for wisdom and trust. 
What Africans looking to new partnerships want is to collaborate to accomplish our objectives for a common vision. Ideally, we want to do this from, with people who are aligned <laughs> and seeking mutual benefit. We are far too conscious of greed and exploitation. And the South-South Corporation agenda was founded on the principles of strategic solidarity, driven by us, the people of the Global South, evaluated on our own indicators for accomplishment and fulfillment, guided by our own information, knowledge, technology transfer, and exchanges for best practice adaptation. So as people with the voices to express our reality, we create, innovate, and expand our own agendas, which means that new partnerships for new markets are an avenue for growth and learning. This I know from experience, that new people will awaken new ideas and methods. New people will also trigger in us new irritations and new dilemmas. And as Rosalie demonstrated, Africa and the Caribbean share historically an intrinsic bond, whether we liked it or not. But I believe that we have been paving the way to engage in a way that honors the motherland and acknowledges the contribution of African culture and values to the entire Caribbean and Latin America especially. And this desire for proximity, especially from the diaspora, is the route for commerce and enterprise to flourish in numerous sectors. The creative economy, arts, crafts, music, fashion, digital technology and cultural exchange, agribusiness, tourism and hospitality, real estate, manufacturing, and in particular, the know-how on the transition to home-based production or home-based manufacturing, a lot of the load of which women are carrying today. Equally significant is socially impactful philanthropy. But new relationships require the willingness to unlearn our own biases, conscious and unconscious, to forge reliable and trustworthy collaborations in which we establish ourselves, each one of us as trustworthy people. New relations for Africa with the Caribbean and the Global South requires two things. One, investing with entrepreneurs as willing and patient participants in a development process. And this must come before the false perception of quick profit. Africa has the highest number of entrepreneurs in the world, including full-time business owners in the informal economy. And currently, only 20% of startup cash for local businesses comes from African investors. And two, following the four Ps, four Ps, patience, presence, perseverance, people. Work with reliable and trustworthy counterparts who understand the intricacies of local systems on both sides, who minimize risk and maximize returns, credibility, and impact. The future that I see for us in new partnerships, for new markets, are based on the standards of ethical cooperation, the kind that bring peace of mind, the kind which operates and grows through trial and error in accordance with the code of honor. These relationships can take time to attract and time to build. They require carefully seeking out the people we want to engage into the future with. And that's why today's wisdom conversation is today's wisdom conversation. Today is the beginning of the creation of a conscious marketplace for Africa and the Caribbean. Who are the true and current drivers of African, Caribbean, and Global South prosperity in business and development? That's right. We are. Thank you.
thank you all for allowing me to add my part and my passion <laughs> for collaboration and conscious collaboration. And I, and, and I know that there are several people who have been um, engaging with us on the chat um, who may want to share their questions, who may want to share their, um, share their remarks. Um, and I do know that um, I'm just getting a, a message, I believe, from um, uh, Honorable uh, Fabian, uh, the, the Kenyan member of parliament, who had earlier said it was his first time, so he wanted to wait to say something. I believe you want to share something now. Thank you very much, uh, Zaina. It's wisdom. It's good to meet this team. Also, uh, Professor Amiton, very good and perfect presentation. Thank you very much. I can see now is wisdom and uh, very much to see about wisdom and South South for women. You know, like today in Kenya, we're having a challenge of two that gender of women in politics. We are saying that there is a section two, uh, article 261, sub article seven of our constitution. We need two that gender to be presented in the parliament and in the government. But has become a challenge we as members of parliament to do application of the article. But my question is that, do we need to make laws to give women jobs? Or are we going to give a free economy for women, a boy child and boy girls to have for their rights? Anyway, thank you. That was uh, just my question. My name is Fabian Chulemuli, a member of parliament from Kenya. I'm happy to be part of this team. And uh, I can see, as you said about Kenya, Kenya is good for tourism, like everybody's giving the point that it is good, especially when you go to Masai Mara, it's good for all life, you have beautiful uh, mountains. Also in the coastal part, we have good beaches. And I can say everybody is welcome. This is a good country, also for investment, and the most likely even the small business. The economy of this country, like giving our country, like maybe a, a fair environment, Kenya might be the, among the African countries which are going to second world. The economy in Kenya, if small investment can grow, because uh, uh, we are not so much sophisticated in terms of giving license, in terms of uh, things like small business, big business, all is business here. I've seen many small business from Asia, from Europe, they come as small, but given like three years they grow. It is true that we need to give a micro business and manage them to grow, as what Zaina is saying. But the message we say, we, we can make it. What about the individual? Is it that we are going to stand as a team or as a community? If somebody is not dedicated to get yourself to where you are to grow, how will other people make you to move? So I'm very much happy to be part of this team. And I wish we can have many and many talks about how we can develop not only Africa, also the other youthful countries everywhere, especially where it's come to individual growth. Most likely not only about the women, but also our youth. Our youth now, the whole world, they are in time, they are like time bomb. Our youth. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy to be part of this team. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your words and really painting the larger picture of what the potential is um, for collaboration for our young people, for our women, and for lessons learned, right? Information exchange from, from the Caribbean and Latin America on how to give more um, access to our women in, in politics. Thank you so much for that. Um, I know that we have um, Lisa. Lisa, uh, Lisa Brown, your messages have been coming to me privately and I, and I wonder if you would want to state um, some of your comments or your questions um, on the chat. And if there's anybody else who has a question or a remark, um, yeah. we actually want, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, my name is Theo Chambers. Hi, Theo. And uh, I was born in Panama to maternal and paternal grandparents from Jamaica, where I live now. My mother's from Costa Rica. According to my DNA, I'm 84% South African with 47% 
Nigerian. I'm from Ghana, so I'm a multinational. Mm -hmm. I want to say what a great, great presentation. I am so impressed with this. I'm a 24-year-old young man trapped in a 71-year-old body, and I'm ready to go to work. <laughs> I have built four web websites I want to share with each one of you. My wife and I own the website called accessafrica.com with a K-A. Please bring it up. And our job is to unite all the chambers of commerce in Africa with the Caribbean, all the different companies and, and so forth with the Caribbean. We also own the Caribbean Financial Network.com. I put it in, 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 the, in the chat where we want to identify all the banks and financial institutions in Africa with those in, in the Caribbean to collaborate and network. We have a portal where people can find all the financial institutions under one umbrella. We also have developed Carib Store, C-A-R-I-B store.com, where, where we are trading right now African clothes and soap and so forth and so on. So we're trying to do net, network and from the spiritual side, we have Theoism, T-H-E-O-I-S-E-M.com. And I'm going to put it back again, all four of those, to see how we can collaborate and help and work together as a team. I just put it in, in, in the chat now. And I think it's a great, great, great beginning. But we must, uh, we must implement these ideas like yesterday and not just deal in each time we meet, we have a debate and no action. And I think that there's a lot of us who can regurgitate the past and historical stuff, but there's no movement toward accomplishing our goals and objectives. And I think that what I like to work with is how can we start today to start to identify all those grants that are available. Let's identify those financial institutions who's willing to give a credit card. We, who in Africa have the best payment gate, gate, gateway that e-commerce black-owned business can use those e-commerce right now? Not wait for perfection, but we must start this week to start to decide, yes, I'm ready to do business. How can we start from put the first block down today and not tomorrow? And those are my can, can, can contribution. I'm open, ready to go to work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Theo. Um, let me just say that um, perhaps, Zana, we should talk about going forward. We yes. actually are very convinced that, you know, we must do less talk and more action. And this is one of several engagements that we want to um, pursue going in the future. And the next one is really an opportunity for all of us to meet and discuss our interests in different um, sectorial groupings, doing breakout sessions. So you have an opportunity. There's some meeting and interaction that's taking place right now in the chat. We are sharing information, emails, and so on. That's great. But we can do more to hear from each other because there's a lot of, um, we all come from rich experiences and many of us are in business and want this collaboration. So stay in touch. We will, um, we're hoping to do this sometime in November um, and uh, we'll set the date and then we'll let you know. Perfect. And to add on to, to build on to what Rosalie has just said, um, to demonstrate our seriousness, I'm going to launch a poll and that Paul is going to ask you what sectors of interest you are interested in moving forward between Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Global South. Um, it's a multiple choice um, poll. Please let me know that it's shown up on your screens. Yes, it's shown up. Okay, great. Perfect. Yes. Um, this is going to be feeding into our next stage of planning meetings which are going to culminate in, before the end of the year, a forum that is all about the creation of a marketplace um, between Africa and the Caribbean. And we want to make sure that we are addressing what is truly required and necessary um, for each one of us.
while while this is happening, if I may, um, Zana, just say something to His Excellency. I think the point about legal arrangements to help women, I, I'm of, always mindful of what happened in Rwanda, where legal arrangements, quotas were put in place. And before you know it, Rwanda became the leading country in the world with respect to female representation in parliament. Um, that came directly out of the active legislation. You see, um, you know, law making a difference, say, in the US with the whole civil rights movement, et cetera. So the law can take us so far. However, I think beyond the law, the law is not enough. There is an important um, public education, I think, that's required um, for men to understand better, come to grips with some of the traditions that we have held onto, both men and women, for that matter. And it's that deeper understanding, experiential understanding of the realities of women and men that I think will shift us to a better place. Thank you so much. Um, we'll give you- Sana? Uh, yes, please. Uh, this is uh, Sharon Paris Chambers from Jamaica. A uh, brilliant um, wisdom dialogue and uh, you know, beautiful people coming together great thought leaders. Rosalia Hamilton has been someone that we worked with, with the, uh, at, through the MSME and uh, law of, uh, of um, economics. We Institute believe that out of Institute of Law and Economics that um, we can begin now, today, um, to choose groups that we can begin to work with. I know sometimes trust is an issue, but out of this grouping, if we can find, uh, as Dr. Rosalia said, sectoral and regional uh, collaborations, we need collaborations in our city, in our towns, in our nations, that we could begin working with the ideas that we have now to collaborate. And th through out of the chat, we must be able to walk away with names, contacts, that we could begin these weekly dialogue with. So we can begin right away as you develop your plans for the that international marketplace. There's so much ideas we have brimming. I think you, uh, you muted yourself, Sharon? Sorry, one of the things that we do now is to bring women together from around the Caribbean and the world to speak about um, family, self-development, spiritual development, and the sacred feminine, understanding the role of women stepping into their power now, taking control of uh, their future and helping other women to do so and working together with the sacred uh, masculine in a different way than we have before with power with authority with uh, love and compassion and that's why i'm so grateful for what you have done with passion and integrity to come together to use the wisdom that we have as african people to build our businesses and our economies, to strengthen ourselves. Imagine us coming together in an Africa, a new Africa with new vision and this greatness that we have, creating new empires for the future. This is what we are about. We, right here, right now, as you have identified, are the foundation of that new Africa, the new world that we are seeking. So let us start now by choosing teams that we can work with, to build with, with similar ideas and passions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon, for your uplifting um, uh, comments and intervention. And you seem to have read into Rosalia's and my minds, <laughs> as that will be the exact next step that we will be taking. Um, I love your ambition to do this weekly. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we, you, what, you can, what you can count on us for from this session is to be in touch with you about concrete and solid next steps. And each step will be collaborative. Uh, this is important to us. I think we recognize from the first conversation we have, and Trevor can tell you, 
we have been trying to to do this to bring you know to to bring this african caribbean connection together since he and i met um three years ago <laughs> so the time is now uh the time is truly now um and actually i just wanted to say i know that omar we were going to give you a chance Indeed. as we finish up uh, to also talk about Zanzibar. I don't know if you, Tanzania, I don't know if you figured out your sound. Yes, Rainier. Uh, I, sign, uh, I want. I think we, we lost him, right? Yeah, I think he froze bandwidth. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll get him back ASAP. Um, Omari, do you want to do you want to say your your part? You want to tell us? I the just truth? Want to know, are you hearing me? Yes. You hear me there? Yes. All right. I think I had a problem with the audio. Uh, I'm Omari, Tanzania, who live in Argentina. I'm from Zanzibar. So a little bit comment about Tanzania. We call it the land of. Kilimanjaro, Serengeti, and Zanzibar. Uh, I, I see you, you present as well Kilimanjaro, part of Kenya. Yeah, it's true. If you want to, to have a good view of Kilimanjaro, you have to be in Kenya, in the, in the part of Amboseli. But we say if you want to claim, you have to come to Tanzania. So, in Tanzania and Kenya, we, we, have, a, we have a very... Uh, what do we call, you know, I used to speak Spanish here, so I start to lose my English, but I'm trying to <laughs> go on with it. Tanzania and Kenya are like brothers. We, 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 we are together in migration when the animal leave from Serengeti, cross to Rio Mara and going to, to the park of Kenya. We have, the, we share the same Maasai, who was some Maasai in Tanzania and Maasai in Kenya. So Tanzania also is very, it's very touristic country, as we, as we say, in, in terms of safari and in terms of Zanzibar for the, for the relax of the beaches. And Zanzibar is very famous now for the, for the Freddie Mercury, because Freddie was born in Zanzibar. And it's very, it's very famous for the, for the spices. There's a lot of spices plantation. <laughs> so, it was nice to, to participate in this meeting and thanks for the little chance you're giving to me to talk. I appreciate and thanks for all who we are we are here and I, I, I don't have much to say, you know. We are we are we are the we are the Swahili people. We are very poly poly. We are we don't have a lot of to talk, Tanzanian, just a little bit and <laughs> what I can say is Tanzania was like a sleeping giant, you know, it's like a sleeping, was like a sleeping buffalo. And now it's about to wake up and it's about to, to walk now. There's a lot of good things now starting in Tanzania when I'm here in Argentina, but every day when I look in Tanzania, now I see everything is, is much because of the leader we have now. We have a, a leader, a president which has got a pure nationalism, I call it. He, he want to push up the country to, to go with the, the, velo the velocity of the, of the world, we are calling like that. So thank, thank you for the so time. Thank you so much, Amadi. I appreciate it. Okay. To you, we can all say Asante Sana. Asante, Asante Sana. sana means thank you in Swahili. Yeah. Pole Pole means slow, slow. slow, slow. <laughs> Take your time. No hurry oh, in yeah. Africa. Oh, hard. Oh, hard. <laughs> pole Pole. Thanks, so, Asante Sana, Omari. Um, okay, okay. I will share the results from the from the poll. So you can see that agribusiness is the highest sector of interest, followed by the creative economy, then um, tech and digital social media, um, and then professional no professional services, and then hospitality and tech, and then education, and then real estate and, and architecture. Thank you so much for your feedback. This is going to inform how we move forward from today. Speaking of the sleeping buffalo that is now awakening, <laughs> it is time for Africa and the Caribbean. The moment is now. And we thank you all. First to Rosalie for being here today,
for making today happen with us, to Trevor for the introduction and his foresight in putting us together, <laughs> to everybody who has taken time to be here today in their time zones, um, and to contribute with your energy, to participate with your voice. We believe at South South Women in amplifying the voices of role models and influencers who create everyday change, who create everyday um, momentum towards the future that we are striving and seeking to build together. Thank you all for being here. Um, if there are any final comments, please go for it. Otherwise, I invite you to unmute yourselves and say goodbye in the language of your choice. Thank you so much, Sana. You've been wonderful. Thank you very Bye, much. Walk Thank good, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It was very interesting. Walk good. Thank you. It was very interesting. Peace and love. Thank Great you. to be Enjoy. here. Enjoy. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. One love. One love. One love from Jamaica. One heart. One heart. Theo, thank you very much for your contributions. Namaskar. Good. All right.